Okay, first of all, uh, we're going to start with vowels and consonants. Any questions? That works. Okay. Vowels and consonants, do we have any questions? If we do, please ask quickly so we can move on. No questions? Everything's clear? Okay, Vivian, good. On um, page uh, 76, uh, it says uh, there are 37 sounds in many forms of general. American English, mm -hmm. but uh, I see the uh, next two uh, sentences. Mm -hmm. uh, there are almost 38 times 38. So I, I don't know why. Uh, it's there's 37 and 38. Mm. Oh, one problem is probably ah and ah. Uh. Uh. Sorry? Sorry. 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 Counted silence. Oh, oh very good. <laughs> Okay, I didn't bring my book this time, so yeah, silence, thank you, good. That's all that. Anything else? That's it? Hand in your work, please. Which chapter are you going to read for next week? Chapter 9 for next week, good. And you wrote very interesting uh, essays about passive learners in Taiwan. And I would like you to, this is an assignment, I would like you to mail them to Feather Mountain. Mail your essay on passive learners to Feather Mountain. Passive learners and pronunciation. And somebody quoted, a, two people, two or three people quoted a Taiwanese proverb, Gina Lang Wu Hi Bo Tsui. Right? Well, anyway, I tried it out with a Taiwanese man and he said it was good. Um, how do we say that in English? Children should be seen, not heard. That's it. Children should be seen and not heard. That's how we say it in English. Children should be seen and not heard. So we have the same saying. Ginalang uhi botsi. All right. Um, yeah, so send them to me to uh, Feather Mountain. And basically, today we're going to work further on Chapter 8. We're going to try to work on chapter eight, get through as much as we can. And we will have question? Uh we're just wondering about the father because it sounds like you should let your child call me about the kids. But that you she should be very proud of That's right. Yeah. That's it. That's what it means. Basically, in the Taiwanese, they say children should sit and listen and not speak up, yeah. right? But it means pretty much the same in English. It doesn't, it doesn't emphasize listening the way the Taiwanese does. So, that means you're going, to, you're going to listen, right? We just say you can be seen. People can see that you have cute little kids in the house. So you shouldn't hide them in a bedroom, but you also shouldn't, they shouldn't be speaking up and saying inappropriate things. So it is a little different, you're right. But I think they're pretty close. Yeah, okay. Anything else before we go on? We're just going to keep reading in chapter 8. And we'll have, we probably will have some tutorials next week, but Carol is going to be gone for two classes, so we may postpone it because some of them, we may do some of the easier ones, but we'll probably put off the decibels until Carol is back. It's hard to do on your own because it's a lot of stuff. Okay, let's continue. Wendy, go. Nose in s is centered at a high frequency between um, 5,000 5, and 6,000 hertz in figure 8.9. 8.9. 8.9. Mm -hmm. In sh, it is lower, extending down to about uh, 20. 2,500. 2,500 hertz. Watch the, watch the V, say it again. 2,500 hertz. Mm -hmm. Since both sh and s have a say it again. Since since both s 
and sh right. has a comparatively large acoustic intensity. That's good. I'm, I'm being picky now. First of all, since, since. Good, that's good. And the other thing is slow down a bit, when you, especially when you have a single syllable stressed word, like large. So have a comparatively large acoustic tendency instead of have a comparatively large acoustic tendency. It's harder to understand that way and it's not quite English rhythm. You can do it when you're in a hurry, but have a comparatively large acoustic intensity. That's the way we usually say it. Go ahead. Have a comparatively large acoustic intensity they produce they produce darker patterns that f or th eh? then th or th mm -hmm. they are also marked also. also marked by distinctive performance trans transition hmm? transitions 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 the apart the uh, Apparent origin, the locus origin. This tone way you give it a separate intonation group, so it's a separate thought group basically. The ap apparent origin, the locus of the second formant transition, increases throughout the four words. The four words. The four words. Mm -hmm. Phi, thy, sai, shy. Right, phi. It's voiceless. Phi, thai, sai, shai. Phi, thai, sai, shai. Right. So that in shai, it in is shy. in shai. Right. It is in a position in a, in a, right. in a position comparable to comparable. Comparable is okay. I say comparable. Comparable uh -huh. to its location in the vowel it. E, e uh -huh. and falls considerably. All right, here we're talk we're looking at s and sh we're comparing the two, and we see them on the previous page, on two hundred one. So where the noise is centered is the part of the noise that you see spread across vertically, spread across uh, the range of frequencies, and the center is where it's darkest. You go to the middle of the very darkest part, and that's the center frequency. So compare the center frequency for si with sh in figure 8.9. About how many hertz is the center, well, the center frequency is at about how many hertz for the for si? We're at the bottom of 201, it's the second one from the right. For psi, it's the beginning of psi. So look for the dark here, I'll show it to you if you don't know what I'm talking about. Here is the noise part of the spectrogram that reflects the pronunciation of s. And here is the darkest part, right? Right here is the darkest part. And we go to right about the middle of the darkest part, that's the center frequency we're looking for. Compare that to the darkest part of sh, which is right next to it, and we pick about the middle of that darkest part. Is that lower or higher than s? Yeah, for sh, it's lower. You see it very clearly on the spectrogram. So, sh, 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 you hear it very easily with your ears. Right, try it yourself. Big difference, right? So, it's random noise, but it's noise within a certain area. It's just within a certain domain. And it's random, but it's centered on a certain frequency. So if you find the middle of the darkest part, that's the center frequency, what is the approximate center frequency for s? 5,000, a bit more than that, I would say. A little more than 5,000. The really dark part. Maybe 52, 52, 53, 100 hertz. How about for sh? It's around, around 3,000, right? So those are the center frequencies, so we know that it really is a lot higher. And the other thing he says to notice is we still can see the formants. So look at sh. Can you see the formant lines? Look at the bottom of the noise part of shy. Can you see that there are two dark bars there? Mm -hmm. So we still see the 
the formant bars because we're not using the vocal folds to, to um, excite the spaces and make them vibrate at their, net, their resonant frequencies, but the noise also excites those frequencies a bit, not as loud, but they also excite those resonant frequencies. So we can see the formant lines. Um, let's go back to what R Wendy was reading to see how he said it. It says, the apparent origin of the second formant transition increases throughout the four words. Uh, it's in a position comparable to its location in the vowel E and falls considerably. Okay, so um, you can still see the formant lines there. Okay, and you can also see them for s I think that will do. Let's keep going. The voice fricatives con corresponding to f s sh sh do not contrast at the beginning of words. Accordingly, figure 8.10 shows v z z sh sh between vowels. These voice fricatives have patterns similar to their voiceless counterparts, but with the addition, with the addition of the vertical striations, 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 mm -hmm. indicative of voicing. The fricative component of v in ever is ever fainter than the f in face, and is really only visible at the start of the following vowel. The vertical striations due to the voicing are apparent throughout the articulation. Articu. Articulation. Mm -hmm. yeah. The same is true same. same. The same is true of th in weather. As with their voiceless counterparts. As with their voiceless counterparts as with their voiceless counterparts, it is the formant in the adjacent vowels in, in the adjacent in the adjacent vowels that distinguish these words. These these mm -hmm. words mm -hmm. in this figure, both these fricatives are both these fricatives. Both these fricatives. Both of both these fricatives. It's both these. Both is important here. Both both these fricatives. Both, both these fricatives mm -hmm. are preceded by a mm -hmm. and followed by er. The second formants are much higher around th than around v. Mm -hmm. Around v, where it's voiced. Now, first of all, we have problems finding words that contrast only in their initial consonant, in their initial fricative in this case. So for the last figure, we used Phi, phi, psi, shy, but we're not using this time, we're not using vi, thy, zai, zai, because vi is a word, thy is a word. Neither, or vi is sort of common, thy is an old word, but we don't have the word zai in English and we don't have the word zai. Because they're not real words and we wanted to get natural language data, what did we do instead of putting them at the beginning of a word? Put them between vowels and e and er, right? The vowels e plus er. And the voice fricatives have patterns similar to their voiceless counterparts. What is the counterpart, for example, of s? The voiced counterpart of s. Z, s, huh? Not z. Z, right. So we're going to compare the two and see how different they are. Their patterns are very similar to the voiceless counterparts, but we have something added to them, namely, right, the striations that indicate that there's voicing. So look at f in 8.9 and compare it to v in 8.10. Everybody do that. Look at the stripes that you can sort of see in the noise part of the first spectrogram of 8.9. It's pretty light. Why don't we look at z and, and s, s and z, because those are darker. So look at psi, look at the s part of psi, and compare it to fizz, fizzer, fizzer. Look at the z, look at s, and then look at z. 
Are they similar? Right, but what do you notice in z? It's darker, you can see more of the formants, and we've got the vertical striations that shows it's voiced. And how about for sh and zh? So shy in 8.9 compared with pleasure. What looks really the same? What part looks really similar? Exactly. It's the distribution of energy, that we have energy concentrated in the same place, and we have lower energy covering the same, um, the same range of frequencies. But we do have the vertical lines again. All right. And the same is true for v and for the, except for it's a little bit lighter in, in, in 8.9, so it's a little harder to see. But they, they are also similar. Okay? Mm. It is the formants and the adjacent vowels that distinguish these words. So, um, as with their voiceless counterparts, and the, it is the formants in the adjacent vowels that distinguish these words. So, in this figure, because these fricatives are preceded by e and followed by er, the second formants are much higher around the v than around v. So, the direction that the formant comes from when it goes into the consonant depends on the Vowel, right. The vowel on each side is going to determine where we find that format. Okay? I think that's clear. Let's go on. Yeah? Uh, I think the mm -hmm. is not the set. It is not. It's, yeah, it's, it should look like it's a uh, voiceless one. That's right, it what does. What can we do if we <laughs> encounter this kind of... Okay. Um, we see a voice bar in all of the others, don't we? But it's really light, or we can barely see. We can see the beginning of a voice bar. If you look at the bottom, we see the beginning of one. So this one may have become partially voiceless. So pleasure probably became partially voiceless, and that's what most, most voice obstruents do anyway. Stops and fricatives. They start out voiced about halfway through. They stop being voiced. Usually if there's a vowel coming later, they will stay voiced, but not always. So pleasure, it could have become voiceless. Yeah, it could have. It's pretty common, especially if it's a bit longer. Pleasure, we won't overdo the voicing all the way through. So uh, it was a great pleasure, pleasure. Just listen to me say it a few times and you tell me if you can catch voicelessness. I'm not gonna do anything on purpose. It was a great pleasure to meet you. It was a great pleasure to meet you. It was a great pleasure. Pleasure. It goes by so fast, it's hard to tell. Sometimes our ears and reactions are not fast enough. Pleasure. Pleasure. Home in Kananyodian voicelessness. Yeah, it's not a very surprising thing. Can we go on? Unless there are more questions? Let's go. The fructive energy in the higher frequencies. Frequencies. Everybody watch that. The KK is should be E if it's either Y at the end of a word or the, freak, or the plural IES. Frequencies. Frequencies mm -hmm. is very apparent in z and j. Mm -hmm. There is a faint voice bar. Faint. Faint yep. voice bar in z, but in j, the voicing is hard to see. There are only a few vertical striations, striations mm -hmm. due to voicing in the 6,000 to 8,000 hertz range and the beginning of the fricative noise. Fricative noise. Fricative mm -hmm. noise. The formant transition form z in from, from. from mm -hmm. z into the vowel er is level, but that form z falls. But that from. That from z falls consi considerably. Let's follow what they're saying. So. Um, there are only a few vertical striations due to voicing in the 6,000 to 8,000 range at the beginning of the fricative noise. So that's what I was saying. At the beginning of the zhe, we do see some. But as it goes on, we don't see that many striations clearly. Um, the form and transition from z into the vowel, er, is level. 
but the je in je, the voicing is hard to see. So it's just re repeating basically what Carol already observed. Okay? And there are only a few that uh, we did that. The format transition from z, okay. This last word, pleasure, also enables us. Oh, have we read that? You go ahead. It's your turn. This last word, pleasure, also enables us to see what happens when an aspirated stop, such, stop. stop mm -hmm. such as p is followed by an approximate such as l. Uh. Most of the l uh, is voiceless, audible only by the effect of the effect it has on the p burst and the aspiration noise. Okay, so look at what we have above do we see much of anything at all? We see some marks at the formants, but we see no voice bar there. Of course, there shouldn't be. We don't have voicing. L becomes assimilated, and that becomes voiceless. And there's very little energy anywhere. We see little bits and pieces at some of the formants, but not much. Pleasure. OK, let's go on. The last set of English consonants to consider are the lateral and central approximants, l, r, w, y. Figure 8.11 shows these sounds in the words lad, rad, wad, yil. Okay. They should all be the same vowel. You're going wad, yil. It should be. All of them are eh. And there was another word that I caught there. Um, central approximants. What was the word that you, where you said eh as eh? Last series of English consonants to consider are the lateral and central approximants. I want you to read it again, and I'll get it. Go. The last set of English consonants. English consonants. English consonants to consider. To consider. To consider mm -hmm. are the lateral and central approximants. Approximants. Approx approximants. Figure 8.11 show these. 11, that was the word. 11. 11. Yeah, I'm being picky. 11. 11. Make sure that you don't say 11. 11. 11. Yeah. Shows these sounds in. Shows these sounds. Shows th these sounds mm -hmm. in the words lead, red. Lead. Look at me. Lead. lead. Smile. Lead. That's better. Lead. <laughs> keep, your, keep your jaw up a little higher. Lead, red, wed, yell. Lead, red, wed, yell. Yell is different from the others, but it shouldn't be. Yell. 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 Not ill. Yell. 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 That's better. Yell. And wed. Wed. That's better. Red. Red. Lead. Lead. You can close even a little more because you're still in you and pian zhang ah. Not quite, but a little bit. So make your jaw even higher. Lead. Red. Wed. Yell. Lead. 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 Push up. Lead. Lead. Don't don't move your teeth at all. Lead. Lead. There we go. There we go. Uh, all these voiced approximants have formants not unlike those of vowels. Not unlike those of vowels. Pause a little bit. Those of vowels. Mm -hmm. The initial lateral in the first word has formants with central frequencies. With what? Center frequencies. Mm -hmm. Of approximately 250, 1150, 250, 1100, 1100, and 2400, low intensity, mm -hmm. which change abrupt, abruptly in intensity at the beginning of the vowel. All right, let's look at the beginning of lead. Let's look at the lateral. We find energy at 250, right? 那个 Remember, that's the same thing that happens with what class of sounds? Looks sort of like vowels, but it's got much less energy. Nasals. nasals, exactly. These behave a lot like nasals. Approximants and nasals have a lot of things in common. We called nasals stops, at least some people did, at the beginning of the book, and I said they're not stops, right? Nasals are really much more similar to approximants. They're much more similar to approximants. They're continuants, for one thing. And also, because there's an occlusion in the mouth, they have lower energy. So looking at lead, it's about half or less of the energy of the vowel. And let's look at where the energy falls. 
For F1, it says it's near 250. Does that agree with what you see in the picture? So the center frequency, if you want to see what I'm pointing at or looking at, everybody, right here. center frequency right? That's F1. How about F2? That's close to 1. It looks like at about 1,000, but there's more energy above, so we'll put the center frequency a little higher. It says 1,100. And then low intensity energy around 2,400. Everybody sees those very faint marks around 2,400? Okay, so this is a typical L pattern, a little pattern. Put that in your notes and remember it because we need to recognize this when we're reading spectrograms and we don't have much information to go on. This is a typical wool distribution of energy. Um, okay, continue. As we noted above, as we noted above, as we noted above, okay. a marked change in mm -hmm. Fermi pattern in the Fermi pattern Good, is is characteristic of voice nasals and laterals. Okay, we just remembered that, right? That this looks a lot like nasals. The energy might occur at different places, but 250 is the same, isn't it? Let's go back to where it's talking about the pattern of a typical nasal. It's the top of 201. In nasal consonants, there's usually a very low first formant centered at about 250. So if that's the only information we have, is it easy to tell a lateral apart from a nasal? No, it could be either one. But that's why I said they're very similar. Approximants and nasals are very similar. And then if we look closely, then we see about the 1100 and then the 2400. All right, go on. At the end of a word, as in yell, yell. yell mm -hmm. in figure 8.11, there may be a less marked change. A less marked change. A less marked change. Right. We can see that at the beginning of lead, we have a very faint set of formants for u, but as soon as we go into the vowel e, then it becomes much darker immediately. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's the abrupt change they're talking about. But if it's the l, the u sound at the end of a word, look at going from e to the final dark u, we see almost no change at all in energy. How can we account for that? This one you can figure out based on what you know about L's. Huh? Similar to a vowel, it looks like there's no change, very little change going from et to u. There we go. That's all I'm asking. It's a dark L. We have two kinds of L's. And what, is, what do we know about dark L's? They're velarized and they're more like a back vowel. That's exactly what I was after. Because it's a dark L, it's basically a back vowel. It's not really, it's not really a consonant at all. It's like a back vowel. And that shows up in the spectrogram. So a lot of things we expect just because we're thinking L. And then we remember a dark L is basically like a back High vowel, okay? Mm. Let's go on. A final lateral may have little or no, no central contact, making it not really a lateral, but a not back. Not really. A mm -hmm. lateral, mm -hmm. but a back unrounded vowel. Right. A formant in the neighborhood of 1100 or 1200 hertz is typical of most initial laterals for most speakers. Good, most. Most. Very good. So that 250 hertz of F1 doesn't help us very much because it could be a nasal, but what will help us more? An F2 around 11 or 1200. If you see that, that may be a tip off that you have a nasal, uh, sorry, a lateral on your hands. Let's go on. The second word in figure 8.11 illustrates the approximate er in red. Remember that in the broad transcription, broad, 
broad. Watch that. It looks like broad because, for example, road, load, etc., uh, is often written with OA, but this one's an exception. So broad and broadcast. In the broad transcription of English used in this book, the, si the symbol er is used for the approximate er. Okay, so we're using actually the trill symbol instead of the upside down R, but in this class we're still using the upside down R. Go on. The most obvious feature of this kind of er is the low frequency of the second and third formants. Let's check that out. So the second one has an initial er. Look at F2 and F3. Do they look pretty low? And we already talked about that quite a few times. It's because of Remember we said that L2, I'm sorry, uh, F2 and F3 are going to be pushed down with er because of? There we go. Okay. Lip rounding pushes down the formants. Good. Go on. The third formant in particular has a very low frequency. Is that true? Because the third formant is, no, is higher than the second formant in most cases, at least when the two occur together. But it, we can see that F2 and F3 start at about the same locus. So F3 has a very, very steep ascent. So that's why we say that F3 has an especially low uh, starting point or origin, okay? In this example, its origin above the symbol er is around 1600 hertz. Can we find that? Find about 1600 in the picture and look for the darkest part of, of the consonant. And he says it's around 1600 hertz. Okay. There is a great deal of similarity between red and the, and the third word wet, which, wed. Is, wed, mm -hmm. which is why young children sometimes have difficulty learning to distinguish them. The approximate w also starts with a low position of O3 formants. Oh. Oh. All mm -hmm. three form formants, but this time it is the second formant. It is the second right. formant Good. that has the sharpest rise. Let's pay attention now. Let's look at the let's look at the spectrogram. In R, we just noticed that which formant has the sharpest rise? The third. How about in W? Is it just like he described? The second formant starts really low here, and it has a very steep rise. The third formant, does that also start low? It also does, but not nearly as low as F2. So in this case, what he's saying is pay attention because these two Qs can help us distinguish between an R and a W, a R and a W. And he says that they are, in fact, very similar, and children mix them up. And I've told you the story about how my one of my kindergarten classmates always called me Kelwin, Kelwin, wed instead of red. A lot of children mix up R and W, but often they can hear the difference. They just don't learn how to produce it correctly until probably later in life. Some maybe never fix it. If you don't fix it, though, it's not a good thing in an adult. In fact, I've heard some speakers, especially of British English, who have strange R's. And there's also an American interviewer who has a, has a very strange R. Her name is Barbara Walters. You've heard of her? Ha <laughs> hanyomi. Barbara Walters, write it down because you can check it on YouTube. I'll play it if we have time. She also has an unusual R, and I notice it. There are quite a few British speakers who have unusual R's, and they'll say things like twy instead of try. It's not quite twy, but it's close to twy. The R is not quite an R. And those people are often perceived as sounding childish. So R is something you really have to fix. You want to say something? No, okay. So if your R is odd, you really should fix it. Try to fix it. But R's are hard to fix because I have a friend, a British friend, who used a tap for R. So he'd say red instead of red. Yeah, and brilliant instead of brilliant. Yeah, he had a tap. The funny thing was that he couldn't produce a trill in Spanish. 
可是他英式英语，他的母语，他那个日还是有点日的音，这是很奇怪的事情。And so the first time I met this guy, I said, "Are you Scottish?" Because remember, some Scottish speakers have that r- a trilled R. And he was very embarrassed. He says, "No, no, it's just my R is very strange." And because of that, he said, "This has been embarrassing me too many years." So he decided to fix it. Now. How, do, how long do you think it took him to fix this very particular sound? And it's a very common sound. We use a lot of R's in English. He uses fewer than I do because I have R's after vowels and he doesn't. So how long do you think it took him to fix it? He was 40s. But he's very good at linguistics. And phonetics. But it's your native language. We speak our native languages almost without thinking. We almost don't think when we're speaking. The idea just kind of shinks in our brains and it spills out of our mouths, right? We barely think. And I was really aware of that when I was a little kid. And I, I kept saying things that I heard other people say that I wasn't thinking about. I probably told you this story. And I said, I hate her so much I could kill her. My father said, Did you hear what you just said? I go, Oh. It's really awful. The reason I said it is because the people around me said it. And you still hear it in America all the time. We exaggerate a lot. And so we often say, oh, I could kill her. But it sounds terrible in Chinese. Oh, I really want to kill her. Would you say that? We say that routinely in English, especially kids. Adults will do it too. Just look online. I could kill her. Just look up, I could kill her, or I could kill him. <laughs> do a Google search. See how many hits you find. And then try it in Chinese, compare. It's not really a fair comparison, but it'll just give you an idea of what's out there. People still say it. It was because my father pointed it out. I thought, that's a, that's a 话很重哦 I shouldn't talk about killing people. And I didn't think about it until my father told me about that. And then I realized I was gabbing the whole day without thinking a bit about what I was saying. I was just reacting to what people said With the things my brain pumped out based on what I heard other people say. Does that sound familiar though? Do you do that yourself? Can you feel yourself just saying things because your brain is just popping out with these things without thinking about them too much? That happens in our native language. It happens in our native language. If you learn another language really well, it will happen in that language too. So, anyway, these things pop out without thinking. If you have to stop for every single R and correct it in your native language, Can you imagine how difficult that is? If, if you were going to correct something in your Mandarin, for example, you'd have to constantly, constantly have people remind you, right? And then you would, probably wouldn't be too sure how to say it right. So it took him about half a year, as I remember. And he fixed it. Now it's perfect. Now it's perfect. But that was funny, because he was 四十几岁的人 in his native language, tried to correct this. It's really, really tough. 对，那个音正确的念法，他又搞了好久才把它抓准了。All right, so anyway, w and r are similar. If you have a funny r, you will be noticed. People will notice it. We will really notice it. Yeah. Um. Okay. Go on. The movement of the formants for w are like those in a movement away from a very short u vowel. And why is that? Because we call sounds like w and y, we call them semi-vowels, 半元音、半母音 because they are related to. They're sort of like pegged to a vowel, a certain vowel. Each of the approximants, at least of these, is pegged to a certain vowel, and w is pegged to u. Remember, if we have a word ending with a vowel and another starting with a vowel. For example, if we say "to a," if we want to link it, we say "to wa" because of the "u" sound, right? And it's the same with "ao." For example, "bao wa di bao," bao. We see the "w" there, but this is an "ao" sound with an "u." We also have a "wa" there. So this "wa" is the corresponding approximant. That is related to u and u, 
And then it's going to go on and tell you the other one, for example, I, which sounds like I, we've got an I there, or E, he. And if we follow that by a word starting with a vowel, let's go to am here, and is, what's our linking sound? Here we have a little y, I am, I am. It's not that strong, don't overdo it. So I am, yeah, if you go I am, it sounds a bit funny. And he is, we say he is. So you can see that e and i relate to y, u and u relate to w. That's their corresponding approximant. And that's why on the spectrogram in w, we'll see that the movements of the formants for w are like those in a movement away from a very short u. Let's go back to the u and compare. And that's page 194. It's the last vowel in the series. So compare the w and wed to the shape of u. Do we see similarities? The beginning of the w. Compare the beginning of the w and wed to u on page 194. The frequency levels for F1, 2, and 3? F1 is low. And F2 is a little bit above that. And then we've got a bigger space than F3. So isn't that sort of like the Qidian of the W? Right? So they want you to make that connection. And finish the paragraph. Finally. The finally. Finally. Right. The movements of the formants. Uh, we don't know much because we've just said the word. Form both formants and movements, right, we've said both, so we don't need to stress them too much. So the movements of the formants for W, for W, are like those in a movement away from a very short U vowel. Finally, the movements of the formants for, we'll probably do that because it's all repeated, right. So you don't, if you say the movements of the formants, it's just like our example. Oh, 她真的很漂亮, if you remember that, yeah. It sounds like we didn't hear the first person talk. Finally, the movement of the formants for y. Y? Y. I know that's funny because y really shouldn't be able to be lengthened. You know, y. Y. Especially in British English, it's very difficult to lengthen y. It's a little easier in American English. But I can lengthen it and give it a continuation rise. So I would say the movements of the formants for y, y, I will still naturally put a continuation rise there. Finally, the movements of the formants for y, mm -hmm. as in yell or yes, or yes, or yes, are like those in a movement in a, in a mm -hmm. movement away from a very short e vowel. E vowel. E vowel. It's a compound. E vowel. E vowel. They're both nouns. Mm -hmm. Both w and y are appropriately called semi vowels. Very good. Everybody, appropriately. appropriately. She said it right. I just want to remind everybody. Appropriately. Appropriately. Remember the word semi-vowel. That may turn up in a test. Semi-vowel in Chinese is either ban mu yin or ban yuan yin. I'm more used to ban yuan yin because I learned it in the Chinese department. Okay? This is all clear? Everybody remembers what a short e looks like or what an e looks like. Compare e to y like the one in Yale. We have a very low F1, a very high F2, and then F3 is above F2 somewhere. So you can see that very big difference, low F1, high F2, that's a typical E sound, isn't it? Okay? The vagueness of many of the remarks in the preceding paragraphs hmm? is... Oh yeah, it's fine is meant to convey that the interpretation of sound spectrum, spectrograms... That's a, yeah, that's a um, compound. Sound se spectrograms... Mm -mm. <coughs> um, s eh, sound spectrograms... There we go. ...is often not all straightforward. Forward. The, forward. Right. The acoustic... The, the acoustic cor correlates... Correlates, remember? Correlates. Remember in nouns and adjectives, it's usually uts, and this is a noun. Correlates, that means 相对的东西, The acoustic correlates of some articulatory features, articulatory features, articulatory features, mm -hmm. 
are summarized in Table 8.1, but in a book such as this, it is impossible to give a completely detailed account of the acoustics of speech. Of the, uh, of the acoustics of speech. All right, young people. A lot of young people don't make that distinction at all. I do, and so I remind you because I think it sounds better. Um, you read beautifully. You're basically native speaker level, but Amy, I think I would still slow down, and sound more Zhuang Zhongyi Dian rather than in a hurry. Go on. The descriptions that have been given should be regarded as rough guides rather than accounts of as rough guides as rough guides yeah. rather than accounts of invariable structures 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 right. that can be that can always be seen in spectrograms slow down when any of the segments described above occurs in a different phonetic context it may have a surprisingly different acoustic structure so this paragraph is telling you we made the examples very very clear and tidy to teach you the beginning, uh, uh, I would say an introduction, to give you uh, an introduction to spectrogram reading. We made it very clear and tidy. However, in reality, it's not quite anything goes. Anything goes means anything is okay, but that's not quite true. However, it's going to be a lot more ambiguous and difficult to read than what we're getting. This is giving us the impression that if we just remember at what levels the formants occur for certain sounds, we should be able to look at a sentence and just apply what we knew about the different, or what we know about the different levels of the formants, different frequencies of the formants, and be able to read each sound one at a time, one at a time. We're sort of getting that impression, right? Because for nasals and laterals, you'll see energy at 250 hertz, but for laterals, we're going to see energy at uh, 1100 or 1200, so we'll be able to recognize laterals. It's making it sound as though it's very cut and dried, very gan sui, but it's not. And we're going to find that soon. When you're confronted with a spectrogram of natural speech, um, the first thing we usually do is panic, okay? Because it looks like we can't see anything. However, we do have some things that are fairly reliable. For example, the s's and the sh's, those will be very easy to recognize. S and sh. And you now sort of remember the typical patterns, spectral patterns or, or formant patterns of the vowels. Like an E, remember? Low F1, high F2. There you've usually got an E or an I. So we do have some things that are usually pretty reliable cues. But just don't expect everything to be tidy and clear because it's not going to be. Sounds are influenced a lot by the environments in which they occur. So you're going to see a lot of variation and a lot of things that are not so clear. And that was a nice place to stop. Let's review after break. So after break, we're going to start with table 8.1. We're going to go through each of the cues. Okay? Take your break. We're going to go to this list of cues that will help us identify what we see in spectrograms. I think I will go over this with you. We don't have to have somebody read. I'll just go over it with you. And top of page 204, table 8.1, acoustic correlates of consonantal features. Note, these descriptions should be regarded only as rough guides. We're repeating what we already saw on the on previous page. The actual acoustic correlates depend to a great extent on the particular combination of articulatory features in a sound and on the neighboring vowels. These will make a huge difference. You will see some identifying features, but the yin will have a big effect on what you see. So first of all, we can identify a sound as voiced if we see what on the spectrogram? Vertical striations, and these correspond to the vocal folds. All right, so this is sort of like uh, consolidating and summarizing what we already know. We've been through this chapter, and maybe we don't realize how much we can actually recognize in a spectrogram that we know nothing about. Number one, as soon as we see those striations, we know it's a voice sound. That's a really important cue. Second, we're also probably not bad at recognizing bilabial sounds. What will we find? The locus of F2 and F3 will start pretty low because we have, just like lip rounding, we have our lips closed. It's going to have the same effect as lip rounding and even more. That's going to push the formants down. So for F2 and F3, when we see them starting low and going up toward the vowel, 
it may very well be a, what kind of sound? Bilabial sound. Okay, so voice bilabial. Those are two really important features to recognize. And we can also tell the difference between a stop, a, a voiceless stop, a voice stop, and a nasal, because we also know how to recognize nasals, at least somewhat. We'll get to that in a minute. Next, for alveolar sounds, the locust, uh, not locust, locust is Huang Chong. Uh, locust is the Lai Yuan, right? The, the, like, uh, the place of origin, the apparent place of origin is the locust. Of F2 is around 1700 to 1800 hertz, okay? Alveolars are a little harder to recognize. They're flatter usually. But the locus of F2 appears to be around 17 to 1800 hertz. Next, velar, that's our friend, right? Velars are really, really nice. We like velars, velar pinch, right? So we usually have a high locus of F2, and there seems to be a common origin of F2 and F3 transitions, right? That means going into a velar or coming out of a velar we're probably going to see that velar pinch. All right, so that's four things that we know pretty well. Next is retroflex. And we're going to find a general lowering of F3 and also F4, which we usually ignore. But for retroflex sounds, F4 is also affected, and that's mainly because of lip rounding, especially for F3. Okay, we know that lip rounding will push F3 down. Next, for stops, we have two different kind of, kinds of stops to, uh, be, that we need to be able to identify. A stop will be marked by a gap. A gap is a chirko. You go kong by the difang. Not 100% kong by because sometimes we have little formant markings because there may have been some aspiration. Or in the case of voice stops, we'll have some voicing. So we will still probably see some formant markings. So we'll have a gap, dong, And after the gap, for voiceless stops, we will see a, a burst, a spike. Because we have, we've got an explosion, we've got an aspiration for voiceless stops or we'll find a very sharp beginning of form and structure for voice stops. As soon as we see voicing, suddenly we will see that form and structure. So this is a lot of good information too, isn't it? Number one, a gap. Number two, if it's voiceless, we'll get a spike. We'll get a burst of noise right after what? when we have the aspiration. Right? When, we are, when we are releasing the stop and we've got aspiration, then we're going to get a spike or a burst of noise. And if it's voiced, we're going to see form and structure. All right, so here now are six things that we know. We already know pretty well. I remember that many years ago, I was panicking when I thought, oh, I have to learn how to read a spectrogram. I looked at a lot of information on the internet and I started memorizing where the formants are for each vowel and where the, um, what kind of movements you have for each sound. And suddenly it made me feel really lousy. It didn't feel like a, the right way to be learning. But we've been learning it quite naturally step by step, looking at the pictures, hearing the sounds, and sort of paying attention to lighter or darker markings or where specific markers are, like 250 for nasals and laterals. So it's happened pretty organically. So all this stuff so far, you think, yeah, I know that, right? Next, fricatives. Those are really pretty easy to recognize too, especially, which two are especially easy to recognize? Si and shi, they are really easy to recognize. You have almost a sure thing. If you look at this spectrogram, you'll know right away where the si and shi's are. So we have a random noise pattern, but it is, is it 100% random? No, it's usually restricted, restricted to a certain region. And it will have a center frequency, an area where it's very dark. And then the rest will have noise above that, but it's lighter. So we have random noise, but it's within a certain region. And it's, set, its center frequency will help us identify if it's, for example, a si or shi or some other fricative. Okay? Come on. 
Mm. So what else do we know about, um, what else can help us identify fricatives? Random noise pattern, especially where? In the higher frequencies, and that's easy to remember because if we make any kind of fricative noise, ah, uh, ah uh is really low, and all these fricative sounds are really high. So in the higher frequency regions, we see a lot of random noise, we've got a fricative. But it will depend on the place of articulation. The center frequency will change according to the place of articulation. All right, so fricative we've added to our list, not too hard. Nasals, we repeated it a few times, so by now it should be pretty familiar. Um, our first marker for F1 is around, or nasal formants, we're not going to necessarily call it F1, but the first nasal formant is around 250, and then just multiply it by 10 and we get 2500. So that's the second one. And then 3250, 3250, so if you just remember 25, 25, 32, that's pretty good. 25, 25, 32. 女生有这样的三位就很奇怪, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> 不好看. <laughs> so lateral. Now, the formant structure for laterals is similar to that of vowels, but we've got the first formant in common with nasals. That's easy to remember, 250. The second one is about half of the second nasal formant, and that's 1,200. And then the third is around 2,400. So it's sort of like a nasal, except 2,500, you just cut it basically in half. All right? And then we get the second lateral formant. And then 2,400, that's close to 2,500. So just think of it, nasal is 25, 25, 32, and then lateral starts at 25, it's half of the 25, and not quite to 25 for the third lateral formant. And the higher formants are considerably what? Reduced in intensity. That means they'll be lighter. They won't be very dark. Finally, so we've got it covered. All we have left is approximants, and that was actually rather dramatic when we went over the approximants. Look over them. Just go back to page 203 at the bottom. What do we see? Especially for r and w and y, we've got pretty distinctive patterns. For r, we've got a very low and quickly rising F3 because of the lip rounding. F2 also rises, not quite as steep as F3. And then they just reverse rolls for the w, which is very similar to r. In this case, we have a rise for F3, but we have a really steep rise for all right, so there we go. For r and w, those are easy to remember. For l, we've already talked about. And then for y, what did we say about y? It has a form and structure very similar to e or i, right? So if you remember the form and structure for e, which is the easiest of all the vowels, easiest of all the vowels to remember, then you can easily remember y. We've covered it. Not hard. It doesn't mean that reading spectrograms is easy, but these cues I think we all have in our heads now pretty clearly, right? That's really a big deal. Just a couple weeks ago, did you, know what a, did you really understand what a formant was a few weeks ago? We really didn't know how vowels were produced and how formants give us the sensation of vowels. But now we're like old hands, also, right? Now we're very comfortable with the terms. When we get new information, do we panic anymore? You don't look panicked to me. It's just more stuff, more stuff to learn. The panic only came when we didn't understand what was going on with formants, basically, because we were doing it in vowels and consonants and it wasn't clarified yet. But now we're okay, all right? Just if we get through decibels, then we'll be in home free, then it's no, no problem. Let's go on to interpreting spectrograms. Now we're going to actually start reading spectrograms cold. He will take our hand at the beginning, hold our hand through the process, but he will give us less and less information as we go along. So at the beginning, it's not so hard. He'll be helping us. But as we go along, it'll get, he'll take away uh, pieces of information. Let's go. Interpreting spectrograms. Again, read it again. Interpreting spectrograms. That's fine. All the words illustrated in spectrograms so far were spoken in, fa in a fairly distinct way. In connected speech, 
as in the reminder that of was the fine i'm being, being picky in connected speech because speech has the tonic in connected speech in connected speech okay connected doesn't have to be stressed so much listen in connected connect we have this kind of baoliu holding back before we get to the tonic tonic Okay, so we say, mm, um, what was the word? Interpreting spectrograms. Uh, in connected speech, sorry, I lost my place. In connected speech, in connected, we've got a nice middle tone here. In connected speech, everyone try that? In connected speech. Watch the D. In connected, we still need to voice that. We need that stop there. In connected speech. In connected speech. Beautiful. Okay. In connected speech, mm -hmm. as in the reminder mm -hmm. of the uh, remainder mm -hmm. of the spectrograms illustrating this chapter, Good. many of the sounds are more difficult to distinguish. Before reading the before? next um, before reading the next paragraph. Good. Transcribe the segments in figure 8.12. Figure. Figure. Right. 8.12. Given the information How that. About the? Uh, given the information mm -hmm. that the utterance. Utterance. The utterance was. Oh, once more. Utterance. Utterance is okay. There will be variation. Like my one of my friends says, interesting. One of the Changchun Teng um, teachers says, interesting. I don't say that. I say interesting. But interesting is pretty common. So utterance or utterance, do mm, And the utterance was, mm -hmm. she, she came back and started again. She came back and started again. Everyone listen a few times, just so you get the stress and the rhythm. She came back and started again. She came back and started again. And which speaker produced the vowels in 8.3? And 8.3 here, I think, means 8.4, mm -hmm. right? Page 194, which speaker produced these vowels? An American or British speaker? American. American, that's the point. That's what they wanted to say. So it was apparently uh, an American speaker who said she came back and started again, all right? Uh, she came back and started again. And started again. And started again. 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 Listen again. Be really careful. I'm being very picky now. She came back and started again. She came back and started again. Mm -hmm. As spoken by the speaker who produced the vowels in figure 8.3. Yeah, your continuation rise and pauses are beautiful now. They're very good. I think what you can do to improve even further is you need to slow down a bit. As sort of like with Amy, slow down a bit, okay? Looking at the segments at uh, one at a time, one at a time. One at a time. Mm -hmm. We can see that the initial sh sound. Sh sound. Sh sound. It's a, it's a sh compound. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sh sound is similar to that in shy in figure in eight. In shy. In what? shy. Mm -hmm. In figure 8.9. All right. So we know that it says she came back and started again. And there's one thing that we ne neglected to do. And we still have a little time. We're OK. I want you all, you have a pencil, because I don't really like writing in pen in books. I used to not write much in books at all, but ever since I started writing reviews on books for journals, I tend to make pencil notes, because I can erase them if I want to, though I usually don't. So if you have a pencil, um, I want you all to transcribe the segments for She Came Back and Started Again on this spectrogram 8.12. Okay, everybody do that now before we continue. We should have done that first before we continued reading. It should be fast because in the future they will make them all the same length and it's a little harder to do. And do it mindfully. So you can just, it would be easy to just fill in the IPA symbols according to the boxes. But as you fill in the symbol, look carefully at what the spectrogram looks like at that point. What the spectrogram looks like for that sound. Uh, just, just finish filling it in. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. <laughs> you don't have to recognize everything immediately, but after you've finished it, then 
，你就一个一个去对 ，and then it will be easier. So you finished? All right. Why don't we just continue now? And if you have questions, they'll probably be clarified in the text. So, Carol, let's go back. Start over again with that paragraph. Looking at the segments one at and、uh, looking at the segments one at a time. One at a time. One at a time.、Mm -hmm. We can see that the initial sh sound is similar to that in shy in Figure eight point nine. The frequency scale is not as extended. X.、Mm. Not extended. X. X. It's not at. It's not as exen extended. 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 There we go. It's not as extended、mm -hmm. as that in Figure eight point nine. Eight point nine. Eight point nine. So that more attention can be paid to the vowel formats,、Good. but vowel formats. But it is、formants、quite. Formants was right the first time. Formants.、Mm, the vowel formants. Yep. But it is quite easy to it see. It is quite easy. But it is quite easy to see. That、easy, 要重一点 Quite but, easy. But it is quite easy to see that this is sh na s, as in segments twelve. Twelve. Twelve.、Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Which has a higher frequency. Very good. Let's just look back quickly. First of all, glance at the sh and she under number one in eight point twelve, and then go back to sh. On page two hundred one, and compare sh and s. Just to remind yourself, but you can always use your ears to remind yourself. S sh s sh. You can hear that sh is lower. So, if we look at two hundred one, the sh has a center frequency around where? In shy on two hundred one, the center frequency is around around three thousand, isn't it? Three thousand, three thousand doidian, 对不对 So let's let's look at this one now. Do we also see a lot of energy around three thousand? Yeah, we see the formants that make it darker. That confuses us about the center frequency because the formants are making it darker. But we still see lots of energy around three thousand. If it were s, then we would find energy starting around where or concentrated around where. If it were s. It would be above four thousand and more energy around five thousand to six thousand, right? And we don't have that. We've got lots of energy around three thousand. So we know that that is sh, and it's not s. That's that part. So number one in the future, when you see this, you can probably know it right away. Usually, when we do spectrograms, we pick pick out the shs and the sis, and then we worry about the rest later. Okay. The second segment. E has e e、mm -hmm. has second and third formant frequencies that are a little lower than in than in this speaker's vowel in Figure eight point three. Okay, so let's just compare very quickly. We're looking at the e and she, and let's go look back at page one ninety four for e. I would have probably higher. Formants, e, she, but this person probably had somewhat lower ones. She, 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 men, them, gal. So it's down a little bit, but it still looks a lot like e or i, right? So we're okay with sh and e. Yes. Okay, ma. Let's go on. At the end of segments two, the second and third formants come together for the velar stop. For the velar stop. For the velar stop,、mm -hmm. that forms segment three. All right, and segment three is what? What is it? K, right? She came, came, because it's K. We're going to see a. We're going to see a gap, absolutely, because it's a voiceless stop. That's right. What else are we going to see? We're going to see a burst, and we do see a burst after three. And what else are we going to see before three? Right, we got velar velar pinch because it's velar. Any time you have a velar, k or g or ng, she, you're getting ready to say the k, right? 
Well, that's going to be typical, but here we have a typical E, low F1, high F2, F3 is a bit above that. Look at, this is F3 here. And F2 is coming up to meet it. Let's, let's use it, let's put it on the screen. The lines indeed are kind of fuzzy and blurry and smeary, but we know what's coming so we can actually look for things we're expecting. Now, in, there's a danger of imposing what we believe is there over something that may or may not actually be there. There's always that danger. But in this case, we do know that that's what they said. We're not guessing with no cues. I mean, we know the sentence that was said. So um, here we've got, I better put the frequency. All right, so here we've got this energy. We know very clearly that this is, we know for sure that this is a, this is a fricative. And we've got all this energy here in the 3000 region. So we're pretty sure about this. This is not a problem. And then she, we're going to get ready to make the cuss sound. So our tongue is already going back. The back of our tongue is going towards the velum. So here we've got F1 is down here. F2 is here. F3 is here. And in fact, we've got this happening here. Yeah, well, I'll try and put it bigger. It's not going to make it 100% clearer. Sangxia, I don't think I'm able to do that. Well, actually, yeah, it's, it's coming up and it's coming, coming down here. They're coming together. It's not really clear, but I'm just saying that Sorry? Yeah, and that's typical for spectrogram reading. And remember, it's so, but just, we're going to have worse things than this in the future. <laughs> so, we're not really so sure here, but in fact, we do have velar pinch. All right, the vowels, your tongue is getting ready to make that stop. Let's go on. This stop is followed by a burst of aspiration. All right, where's the burst of aspiration? That's here. This is the spike. This is the spike. So, We've got a bunch of aspiration there. Okay. Marked as segment four before the onset of the a vowel. A louder, please. Marked as, marked as segment four before the onset of the vowel. All right. So there we've got the release of k at four. So that's the aspiration, the release of k at number four. And then before the onset of the vowel, and then continue. The vowel in came. Good. Number five mm -hmm. is a diphthong A with a faint addition, additional format around um, 11, 1100 hertz associate, associated with the nasalization of the vowel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's look for that. Here's our spike, and we've got a bunch of aspiration, and we've got a vowel here which is not hugely clear. It's probably clearer than the, in the book than it is up here. Um, we, we see this, um, we see this stuff here, right? And it wants, uh, what, what, um, what frequencies are we looking for? We have a faint additional formant around here, around 1100. And this is a vowel that we've got here. It's a diphthong going from a, uh, from a, e, k, e. A to E, but we've also got nasalization because of the M that's coming. And then you will see some kinds of indications of the nasalization. So he's saying, watch out for this. That's typical of nasalization. Okay, and this vowel is not really hugely dark and clear, came. It went by pretty fast. The nasalization probably has something to do with that. It, wipes out some of the formant data. So we've got that F, F1 at the bottom, we've got that 1100 data, that uh, 1100 faint marking for the nasalization, and then we've got the rest of the vowel up there for the E, A. Okay, let's go on. At the end of the bilabial nasal six, 
bilabial nasal six. At the end of the bilabial nasal six. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm going to put this down so we can see the numbers. This is a bilabial nasal. We're at six. And what do we have here? We've got these that are pretty clear. Mm, faint marks here, not much. But what do we have at six? Go ahead. There is a short B closure. Oh, it seven. doesn't tell us much. We're, we're done. That's it. We have to, we're on our own here. But we remember, what are the approximate formants that we look for for nasals? 250? Twenty-five hundred and thirty-two. Let's see if we have anything here. Twenty-five hundred. We've got something here, don't we? For thirty-two, we don't see anything. Come without some. Okay, let's go on. In which, um, in which the the voicing is just is just barely visible. All right. Here we are now, at seven, and this is b for from uh, the b part of back, and at number seven. And what do we just uh, what do we just barely see here? Here's seven. It's a gap. Actually, you have more in your textbook. There is a gap. The textbook. This one, she said, don't be busa. There is actually, there is actually a voice bar there. A little bit of a voice bar. But we have a little bit. Okay. Uh, the upward transitions after the bilabial stops. A little louder. The upward transitions after the the bilabial stops at the beginning stop. of stop mm -hmm. at the beginning of a eight in back are much more evident. Mm -hmm. Evident. Evident. Not a. Eh. Evident. There we go. That was good. That was a good one. All right, we're now looking at eight. Here we have a nice clear vowel, don't we? And this is a, and compare it to the a that we saw before earlier. On page 194. Compare it to the a in 194. What do we notice about a? The formants are pretty, somewhat evenly spaced, aren't they? And so that's a nice thing to remember. For a, we have fairly evenly spaced formants. And we can see all the way up to f4. We don't need that. But f1, 2, and 3. It's getting close to a. Uh. It's getting close to a. Uh. Okay? So, that we do have, right? Fairly even spacing. One, two, three. All right, so this is actually one of the clearer parts of the spectrogram. Let's go on. There's no difficulty in seeing the coming together of the second and third formants before the velars, velars stop. Before the velars, velars stop. stop. Right, and watch out um, together. Together? Yeah, together. Together. Right, both of the and the vowel instead of together. Together. You still need to work a little bit more on your eh. Um, otherwise, was fine. So for this one, we're looking for velar pinch. Do we see velar pinch? Do you have to use too much imagination this time? Not too much. You can see F2 and F3 are coming together, right? So back, we're going to co, we've got velar pinch. Mm, let's go on. There's there's only a short period of there aspiration. There is only a short period. Slow down a bit. There's only a short period of aspiration, not given a separate segment number, followed by separate. a train. Separate. Not separate. 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 Mm -hmm. separate. Not given a separate segment Good. number, yes. followed by a transition, the coming apart of the second and third formants before a neutral vowel. Uh. 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 At 10. So at 10, we have a, uh, right? Here we have a, uh, and it says that they didn't even mark the transition before that. So um, um, let's see. After k, after k, which is number nine, we have a little bit of that aspiration. You know, get spike. Yeah, we have a spike. That's the aspiration. It's very short. Back k, back again, right? Um, okay, the coming apart of the second and third formants, do we see two and three? 好像要分开了,对不对?开始分开,有分开的趋势,有没有? Okay, so that's at, um, before a neutral vowel, 10. You can see F2 
and F3 are coming apart. All right, and it's followed by, go ahead. This is followed by an alveolar nasal mm. Mm hmm Alveolar, and that's at 11, mm. Okay, and, this is for and, not again, this is and. And that's at 11. We've got very few cues for this one. Mm. Okay, very few cues. So, and, it was probably and rather than and. Came back and, came back and, all right. Next reader. The s uh, s 12 in star started. The okay, listen. Mm. The s 12 in started. The s 12 in started. Started. Started Good. is followed by a short t 13, um, which is only which is only slightly aspirated, as is normal for t uh, whenever it occurs after s in English. In in English. Right. Very good. So here we have the S in 12, which we recognize easily. It's got a higher center frequency. Energy is higher than it is for SH. So we recognize those two pretty easily, especially comparing them. And then we've got at 13, it says um, a, it's only slightly aspirated because it comes after S. So S and T started. It's not started, right? Started. It's just like a, it's, it's basically um, unaspirated, okay? Tiny, tiny bit of aspiration is possible, but basically unaspirated. And then? Mm -hmm. The falling second formant into the vowel, uh, 14, mm -hmm. is typical of the transition from T into A. Uh. All right. So let's, let's look at 14. We've got t going into a, ah. so when you see the formants going up or down to get into that vowel, he's saying it's typical for an alveolar nasal, or I'm sorry, an alveolar consonant going into a. Ah. Okay, let's go on. Mm, the falling of the third formant for the, for the last part of segment 14 is associated with the R coloring. With the R coloring, all right. So, um, the following of the second formant into the vowel, A, ah, mm, in 14. So, here's one, and then, uh, okay, let me just see it clearly here before I say anything. Started. Okay, we've got this coming down. So R to the vowel, let's go on. Approximately the last half of the vowel is roticized. Very good. So A the chimin R the way down. A the homin yo R star star. Okay. And the stop in fifteen has a voice bar and could be symbolized by a tab in a narrow phonetic transcription. All right, let's go to 15. So for 15, we've got a little bit of a voice bar down here. So we have voicing started. It's American. Let's go on. Mm. For many people, including this speaker, this speaker, uh, including this speaker, past tense uh, ED forms after an elevator stop have a fairly high second formant and a low first formant. First formant. First formant. Mm -hmm. uh, the vowel in segment 16 is probably better as e rather than a. Uh. All right, so this is also a typical e or i. It's a little bit lower, so it's more like i than e. So i. Go on. Segment 17. Or uh, sorry, more like i than a is what he's saying. It's more like i started instead of started. I keep telling you to say started, right? But this one apparently said something more like started. And it's still quite common in American. Sorry, let's go on. Segment 17, like 15, is a tap. Uh, All right. We don't see much here. We've got a little, little bit of a little marking here. We don't see much. Go on. The vowel in segment 
eighteen is also it、mm -hmm. unstressed vowels before vowel consonants. Unstressed vowels. Unstressed vowels before vowel consonants are often it rather than、uh, mm, yeah pause. Are often it rather than a.、Uh. All right, let's go to eighteen. And eighteen again, we have something that looks like i rather than a,、uh, because we see that f two is pretty high. It's more towards i than a.、Uh. For a,、uh, f two would be lower. Let's go on. The vider stop g in nineteen is clearly marked by the coming together of the second and third formants in、Here. the vowel.、Mm -hmm. Go ahead. In the vowels on either side of it. On either side means both sides. So we've got F two, F three, F two, F three, velar pinch. Go on. The final syllable in again has again a,、uh, again、uh -huh. in again has a、uh, has a fairly low vowel. Formant one is about as high as it is in segment eight.、Uh, the vowel at and in back. All right. So this is number.、Um, Nineteen, twenty.、Um, the formants we see here are close to a. They're closer to a than to a again or to a. Okay, so it's more like a. Go ahead. Segment twenty could be transcribed as a or a. All right, but again sounds terrible. I still believe it should be again, but they're very similar as we've already noticed. They are really really close. And、segment twenty one is the final nasal n.、Mm. There we go. So twenty one, we don't see much. We've got voicing, and then we've got some nasal formants here. We finished that. All right. Now we have an assignment for next time. Okay. Now you should try segmenting a more difficult utterance. Figure eight thirteen shows a spectrogram of Peter Latifoged saying, "I should have thought. I should have thought spectrograms were unreadable." So that one's going to be in British English. It was spoken in a normal but rapid conversational style. This time, instead of marking the separate segments, we have simply placed evenly spaced lines above the spectrogram. So it was a much easier this time. Even the tongue line 已经调整好了 But now the spaces are all even, so you're going to have to figure out the length of each segment yourself,、um, so that we can refer to particular places. 他就说第几号，我们就可以指某一个地方 Try to write a transcription below these lines. Make sure the symbols you write indicate correctly how the phrase was actually pronounced, rather than how you might say it. And that's really important because sometimes we think a sound should be voiced, but it turns out to be voiceless. Right? We're expecting voicing, like with pleasure. Then we see that there's very little voicing. So this is your assignment for next time. One of your assignments. Also remember the article number eleven of Shudo to include that in your、um, in your notes for next Monday. So、um, segment segment and mark the transcription. Write out the transcription of this、um, of this sentence of this sentence for next time in pencil in your book, or you can copy it if you want a bigger. If you want it to be bigger, and try to do it yourself first, and then when you want some help, just keep reading in the textbook, because it's going to go through it with you, sentence by sentence and bit by bit. Okay,、um, so we've got vowels and consonants. We've got、um, another Shuda article. We've got segmenting and transcription of a trans、uh, of a spectrogram. And next week we will have probably some of the tutorials, but not decibels. And that's it. We'll see you on Monday.